Okay, everyone, what we're looking at here is the tail of a guppy. Yes, guppy the fish. This is a particular piece of video recorded many years ago by a colleague of mine. I have permission to use the video and he does narrate the video, but I don't specifically have permission to use his voice. And since this colleague of mine has passed away, I can't get his permission to use his voice. So I will have to do a voiceover for this piece of video to broadcast it here on the YouTube channel. So bear with me, but I will say to all those listening everywhere, this one is for you, Marty. Thank you very much. But if we watch the video play, we can see the blood moving in this guppy's tail. If you happen to have see-through skin like a guppy does in its tail, you can create a piece of video like this. Now, what you notice is a lot of blood moving around. You can see it. The tip of my arrow is in a capillary network, the smallest of the blood vessels carrying the slowest blood. And you can see red blood cells moving through these capillaries in almost single file. And then the major thoroughfares that you see, straight below the arrow, you can see a vein. And below the vein, here we have an artery. The artery carrying very fast blood from upper left to lower right on your screen. The vein carrying slower blood from the lower right to the upper left on the screen. These two blood vessels here, the artery and the vein, are what's called a corresponding artery vein pair. Now what that means is that those two blood vessels carry blood to and from the same anatomical location, the same part of an organism, the same part of a body. And the capillaries are what serve to connect a venous network and an arterial network. So if you look where the arrow is, you can see red blood cells moving through these capillaries in single file. And just above the arrow, you can see a slower moving small artery. But let's focus our attention on this capillary network. This particular view you see right here is at 100x or low power magnification. So if I wanted to see these capillaries, at higher magnification, here we have them at 400x. So we can see this capillary network and all these capillaries carrying red blood cells in single file. But what I want you to notice as the capillaries dump red blood cells back into this vein that the arrow is on, notice how in some of the capillaries, there's an almost continuous stream of red blood cells, while in others, they only sporadically shoot through. If you imagine the artery, the vein, the arteriole, the venule, these blood vessels as the major roads or highways, then the capillaries are the surface streets. The capillaries are the, the roads through a subdivision. Sometimes the traffic is heavier, sometimes the traffic is light. So notice again, as I pause the video, that in some of these capillaries, the blood vessels are only sporadically going through or not going through at all, while in others, there's almost a steady stream. The reason for this is our capillaries have little rings of smooth muscle called precapillary sphincters on the arterial side that are either open or closed. So if you look to your right, right here, you'll see a precapillary sphincter allowing red blood cells into that downward pointed capillary, it's closed right now. So those, you know, cars or red blood cells are not moving while the one further to the right is open and they're going through. We have this kind of micro control in our capillary network. So I see an open precapillary sphincter right there at the tip of the arrow. Oop, fish is moving. Sorry about that. And then now look, here we are on an artery. And look at how fast that blood is moving through this artery. So fast 
that no matter how we try to focus, we can't even see the individual cells because they are flying through there. Remember, hopefully from your lecture, arteries carry higher pressure, pulsing blood. Veins, like I see above right here, carry slower moving blood. Here we are back in our capillary bed or capillary network. So again, notice these red blood cells gurgling, meandering, moving through, some faster, some slower, some precapillary sphincters open, others closed. And we are constantly regulating the amount of blood, the volume of blood going through different capillaries all the time. People have a hard time understanding once in a while that we have this kind of small control over what happens in our capillary networks. So here we see those red blood cells dumping back into the vein, sort of an on-ramp, moving into venous circulation to carry this blood back to the heart. After, in the capillary bed, these blood cells have dumped out their oxygen, picked up their CO2, all these nice things you learn in lecture. Here we have a very nice view, I'm going to pause for a moment, of a corresponding artery vein pair. You might remember from the last lab, I hope you do, that in a corresponding artery vein pair, the artery has a smaller diameter, thicker wall, the vein a larger diameter, thinner wall. The artery indicated by the pointer right here, notice how fast the blood is moving here, the vein slower. So arteries carry the fastest blood, veins slower blood, and the capillaries the slowest blood. And this artery has a smaller diameter. The vein has a larger diameter. That would be in cross section. So the artery is a smaller hose. The vein is a larger hose. Both carrying blood to and from the same structure, the same organ. So these two vessels would carry the same volume of blood per second, but the artery carries it faster. That's why it can equal the volume because it's carrying blood faster through the artery than is the vein. And this guppy has a relatively fast looking vein there compared to some that you might see, but you can definitely see the changes or differences in diameter between these two vessels. And you can even see those red blood cells, you know, sort of bouncing off the walls of the vein here. The artery carrying blood way too fast. You can't even see what those red blood cells are doing. They're just flying by so quickly. This is perfectly normal and a very, very excellent view of a corresponding artery vein pair. So again, arteries carry blood that's moving the fastest, veins the slowest. Here we have another uh, field of the guppy's tail. These segmented things that you see are actually bones in the tail of the guppy. So these are his tail bones or caudal bones in his caudal fin for the general biologists amongst us. And I can see here at 100x, a capillary network right behind my arrow, slow moving red blood cells. I can see a major blood vessel or larger blood vessel right there. So if we can get this at higher magnification, we might be able to look for what is called a bifurcation or a splitting of an artery. So again, notice those bones. Don't get misled by those. What we're looking for are the blood vessels, a capillary network right here, and we've got sort of an unhappy fish. Sorry, but we're keeping him oxygenated and don't worry about the fish. He's just fine, or he was when this video was made. But look at this capillary network again and see the type of control we actually have. We allow some red blood cells through it, then we stop. Then we'll allow more red blood cells through it, then we stop. Depending on the needs of the tissue, this is what we do. So as we focus here on this blood moving, we can see in this capillary network, the red blood cells moving all around, dumping into that vein that you see in the upper left. You can see that blood in the vein moving back toward the fish's heart. So we see all these red blood cells moving around and around through this capillary network. There's an 
artery below the field that we just can't see in this view. But again, we see all these red blood cells tumbling through the capillaries. Remember for your lectures, the capillary is the only blood vessel with walls thin enough to allow communication exchange between the blood and its environment. So this is where the oxygen transport happens through the capillary wall. This is where the CO2 comes back into the blood through the capillary wall. Now looking at this section of the tail, we got a new fish. What we will try to do is focus once again on some of these blood vessels telling the artery from the vein and looking for what's called a bifurcation, a splitting of an artery because arteries start out bigger and get smaller and smaller and smaller as we get farther away from the heart. You've probably seen that in lab already. I've already shown you that in some blood vessels. So what we have right under the arrow just to the right is an artery. See the artery? And then go to the right and then it splits, forks, diverges, we would say, right here because arteries split and split and split and get smaller and smaller and smaller until they become arterioles, which then lead into capillaries. Probably in your lectures, you've learned about elastic arteries and muscular arteries and arterioles and so on. So it's the arteries that diverge or bifurcate. It's the veins that converge, come together. So let's try to find a different spot here because we have a sort of an unhappy fish and we will look for a bifurcation, a splitting of an artery, an artery having a fork in the road. Let's keep looking. We're just looking around. So see the venous blood moving to your left, arterial blood much faster moving to your right in these vessels. And there, see it right there to the right. Let's get focused on it. I can see a bifurcation, a forking of that artery right about in the center of the field. So if we jump up to 400X, so this is high power on our microscope and just a regular light microscope, nothing special about this. You can see the arterial blood moving from left to right and then it forks right here in the center of the field, right there. That's a forking, that's a bifurcation, that's a divergence. This is what arteries do. Oh, there we go, the fish moved. So we just happen to be in another nice capillary network. So notice these small vessels. So here we go back to the bifurcation. That very rapid arterial blood moving from left to right. And then we see this fork in the road, this bifurcation, or what will probably be easiest for us, instead of using the old fashioned term of bifurcation, let's say that this artery diverges. You can, you can watch the divergence movies. We diverge, we split apart, right? So that's what arteries do. Veins, on the other hand, I can see right here in the lower right, or I could, converge, they come together. So notice where the small blood vessels are leading into that vein right here, going from right to left, that's a convergence. Smaller veins converging into larger veins. Okay, I know what you're saying. There he is again with all those markers he's trying to use up. This is going to be bad. Well, maybe so. First, where else would I be? Right here where I live. Second, I do have to use up the markers. But third, you just watched the little video called the microcirculation in a fish which is a very nice piece of videography, I think you'll agree. And you probably went through and answered the questions like a good student as you watch the video. But that's not exactly the same as knowing how to verbalize these things, say on a lab quiz or a practical exam. Now, I've pre-drawn a few things here on the whiteboard to go through with you on these questions, just to make sure we're all on the same page regarding the answers. I will try to not be quite so verbose as I normally would say in a lecture, but we lecture types 
we tend to talk a lot. And I'm not talking to that many students, so guess what? I get to talk to you, or at least you get to listen to me. So in the first paragraph that we have questions, you're asked which blood vessels are converging and which are diverging. And you probably saw this in that guppy's tail. Now what you notice here is two branched blood vessels that I have drawn. I used a non-red, non-blue color so that you couldn't tell which one's representing arterial or venous blood flow unless you see which direction the blood is moving. In a converging set of vessels, the blood would be going this way or converging from two smaller vessels into one larger. Diverging blood flow going this way would show me blood going from one larger vessel in to two smaller ones. Now we just looked at a whole bunch of blood vessels in our last lab. The arteries carrying blood away from the heart, the veins carrying blood back toward the heart. In which example was the blood converging? That's common in veins. So this picture right here, converging blood vessels, smaller to larger, is representative of veins. Diverging blood, like from a common carotid into an internal and external carotid, for example, diverging blood, this would be exemplified by arteries. So if you see a diagram like this, this would represent veins. A diagram like this, it would represent arteries. Then we have a set of questions. You see them right here. One, two, and three. Which vessels show blood that moves the fastest? Which one shows blood that moves the slowest? And who has the bigger internal diameter or lumen, an artery or a vein? So let's take a look at each one of these questions in turn. The fastest blood you just saw, obviously in the arteries. The fastest blood in the arteries. The slowest blood in the capillaries. In a corresponding artery vein, which blood vessel has the smaller diameter, the artery? Which one has the larger diameter, the vein? Now, you already knew this from lab number two, but let's talk about this a little bit, and that's why I have shown you these three handy dandy Dwayne diagrams artery, vein, capillaries. We know just through straight memorization in lab number two that the artery is rounder, has a thicker wall, smaller diameter hose. The vein might even be oblong in shape, thinner walled, much larger diameter hose. And then the capillaries, tiny, tiny walls and tiny, tiny openings. Why then does capillary blood move the slowest? Now, there's a rule, and I'll try not to get too lectury here because I don't want to steal the thunder of your lecture instructor when they explain this to you, but as the cross-sectional area of a blood vessel, as the hose gets larger, the velocity of blood in it is slower. Now there's a couple ways you could think about this that would still get you to the same point. Think about a corresponding artery and vein 
hair like you might see here in this model. So let's just pick on the external iliac artery and external iliac vein. The artery carrying blood into the leg, the vein carrying blood out of the leg. Now, these two vessels carry the same volume of blood in different directions every second. How do I know that? Well, if one of them was faster or slower than the other with regard to volume, of blood, not meaning how fast it's moving, but if, let's say, the artery carried, I'm just going to make up numbers here, three liters of blood into the leg over some unit of time, and the vein only carried one liter out, do you understand what would happen to the leg? Edema, it would swell up like a, you know, blood-filled water balloon of a leg. If more blood was carried out than carried in, the volume of the leg would decrease. It would deflate. So these two vessels carry the same amount or volume of blood into and out of the leg but they can't carry them at the same speed. Look again at the whiteboard. The artery has a narrower hose, the vein a wider hose. So for this narrow hose to carry the same volume of blood per second as this wide hose, the blood in here would have to be moving faster. Corresponding vein and artery pair. The other way to think about it would just be to look at the straight cross-sectional area of these vessels. Narrower vessel means faster blood, wider vessel means slower blood. The arteries are closer to your heart which generates the pressure and pushes the blood out so it's going to be moving faster at a greater pressure, requiring a thicker wall to prevent the vessel from exploding. How's that? The vein is far away from the heart, anatomically, carrying blood at a lower velocity and a lower pressure, requiring a much narrower wall to prevent it exploding. Fastest in the arteries. Closer to the heart, narrower hose. Smaller diameter. Slowest, wait, slowest where? In the capillaries. This tends to mess people up a little bit when they think about it. Now again, I don't want to steal all the thunder from your lecture instructor, but if you look at the cross-sectional area of the artery and vein, it's easy to determine slower blood, faster blood. If you look at the cross-sectional area of an individual capillary, you would think it would carry blood extremely fast, wouldn't you? No, it doesn't. You have to consider the cross-sectional area of all the capillaries all the billions of capillaries. They carry blood the very slowest. If that doesn't make sense to you, think of it this way. Peripheral resistance of the blood against the internal wall of the vessel tends to change how fast the blood can move. Again, I'm leaving some to your lecture, professors. But think about all these little narrow tubes. These are so narrow that sometimes a red blood cell has to bend itself to get through them. 
So there's a lot of resistance to blood flow overall in a capillary network, which slows the blood down. Fastest blood is in the arteries, closer to the heart, narrow hose. Slowest blood in the capillaries, great peripheral resistance and great total cross-sectional area of the vessels. In an artery and vein pair, which one has the smaller diameter of the artery, which one has the larger diameter, the vein, but you already knew that. So the next item for us in lab number three, you can find on page one is the volume pulse exercise, which is pretty straightforward and easy to understand once I explain it just a little bit. So I want you to look at this finger right here. Doesn't blood move into and then out of this finger? Corresponding to my blood volume and my heart rate. <laughs> you remember that. So as blood is pushed into my finger with each pulse, the very end of my fingertip enlarges because blood has just been shoved into the thing. So my fingertip does sort of one of these. As blood is forced into it. That's a volume change. I can record that using a device called a plethysmograph. And that's actually how you say it. This is a plethysmograph. Many of you have probably seen a plethysmograph before at the gym back in a day when you could go to the gym or have a personal piece of exercise equipment. Those things that actually can monitor your heart rate while you exercise. They typically use a plethysmograph. A plate that you touch, something that wraps around a body part, and as blood is shoved in, to that body part, say your hand, with each cardiac contraction, there's a volume change. <laughs> and it corresponds to your heart rate. So the number of volume changes you have in a minute, <laughs> like that, is your heart rate in beats per minute. So a plethysmograph can actually do two cardiovascular things for me. One, it can tell me how much blood is moving into my finger relative to pre-pulse and post-pulse. It can also be used to determine my heart rate in beats per minute by counting the number of volume pulse waves I have in a given period of time, pretty much identical to the way we did with the ECG back in lab number one. So let me show you the high-tech methodology for applying this plethysmograph to my fingertip. I put my finger on the pad, wrap the Velcro strap, and voila, I'm done. So this little pad will record pulses. It's sensitive enough to show me a deflection on a computer screen caused by this volume of blood being shoved into my fingertip with each contraction of my heart. Most specifically, since it's my index finger, the left ventricle. All I have to do, once I'm hooked up, is click the start button, sit very still, go to my happy place, and let this volume pulse wave run. So I'm getting a nice string of volume pulses and I will pause the machine and move the camera so that you people can see these too. Now we're looking at the actual computer screen for the volume pulses I just generated with a plethysmograph attached to my finger. So what you can see is a deflection up, then down, caused by the volume of blood 
being shoved into my finger over some period of time. This is called a volume pulse wave or a volume pulse trace. The height of the wave from base to peak is called the amplitude. Amplitude is the vocabulary term referring to the height of a waveform. The higher the wave, the higher the amount of blood that's moving into my fingertip. The smaller the wave, the lower the volume of blood that moves into my fingertip. I think that's pretty easy to understand. Also, you will notice down at the bottom, just like we had with the ECG, I have a time window. So I could take a known amount of time, say 15 seconds, and I could count the pulses in 15 seconds and determine my heart rate. So let's try it here from 10 to 25. This wave didn't get caught by 10. If I go straight up, so I have to start with this one. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 are on the screen right now that I can see. I'm moving, keeping track. 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 in 15 seconds. So 17 times 4, just like we did with the ECG, is what? 17 times 4 is 68, if I did the math right in my head, that would be my heart rate, 68 beats per minute, as shown by this volume pulse trace. I need a known time window, and I simply count the peaks to get my heart rate. But I want to look a little closer at this waveform for our purposes of discussion. And for no particular reason at all, I'm going to pick this one right here. I sort of like the look of it. So the one you see slightly to the left there. This waveform right here I want to look at. So blood gets shoved into my index finger. The amplitude of the waveform is indicative of how much blood. But what's this little thing right here? This little piece of strangeness that I see right here. Notice this second little bitty peak. Is that just electrical noise? Well, this is right here, because notice that's not repeated everywhere. This one seems to show up consistently, doesn't it? What I want you to look at is on the falling part of this waveform, I have this little valley, this little gouge, this little trough right there at the tip of my pointer. That is called the dichrotic notch. I want you to look for it. In your lab manual, that's a term. I can ask you to define it. I can ask you to identify it. I can also ask you what causes it. This little valley between the larger peak and the much smaller secondary peak is called the dichrotic notch. Remember that. Let's talk just a little bit about this volume pulse waveform with a couple Duaney original drawings that you can see right here. So we can see this volume pulse. Uh, maybe this one looks a little more like the one you just saw of mine. And what we see is the amplitude 
or height of the wave, we can see a dichrotic notch right here. In the other waveforms, I can see this one in a slightly different position. This one, which appears almost after the whole waveform is over, and in some volume pulses, you don't see a dichrotic notch at all. But when you see one, which again, remember, I can ask you to identify on a quiz or a practical the dichrotic notch, I can also ask you to explain to me what causes the dichrotic notch. Or, being more practical, I can ask you to select the answer for me from a multiple choice quiz, which tells you what causes the dichrotic notch. I've once again drawn the histology cross-section of an artery. It's important to understand the cause of this dichrotic notch that you keep in mind the fact that an artery has an internal and external elastic lamina or membrane, as well as typically having a number of elastin fibers out here in the connective tissue supporting it. Why? Arteries carry pulsatile blood, blood that pulses, like that. And what happens as blood surges through this hose, of course, the walls distend. That's what we see as a volume pulse deflection caused by the contraction of, in a peripheral blood vessel, the left ventricle. So, that's the volume pulse wave. But why a second peak which creates a trench or a trough between them? Well, that's explained by the elastin content in this vessel wall. The dichrotic notch is caused by the elastic recoil of the arterial wall. As blood surges into this vessel, the elastin proteins in the wall, as you might expect, attempt to spring back to their normal size. So as they get stretched out, they try to spring back. So in slow motion, imagine the wall of an artery doing this. Distend, spring back, and then distend. Distend, like that. If you want some sound effects. This elastic recoiling of the arterial wall causes this appearance, this secondary peak with a trench between them. This is what happens in an artery. So what is the cause of the dichrotic notch? I'll repeat myself. It is caused by the elastic recoil of the arterial wall. Do not get confused in your textbook or some online source where they say the dichrotic notch's position, its size, might be affected by respiration. <sighs> might be changed by. That doesn't mean it's caused by. Some people always look for that to be the cause. No, respiration does not cause the dichrotic notch but it can influence how it appears. So the cause of the dichrotic notch is the elastic recoil of the arterial wall. Notice, typically, the upslope is steeper or takes less time than the downslope on a volume pulse wave. Not always, but you generally see that. The reason for this is because the upslope is caused by the contraction of the myocardium. This is an active, fast process. The downslope 
is related to relaxation, which is a passive process. You just let it happen. I won't bore you with all the information about sarcomeres and all that stuff like we had back in 223, which was big fun. But you don't need to worry about it now. The upslope is typically steeper. Downslope is typically more shallow or gradual because it's a passive process. And the dichrotic notch right here caused by elastic recoil of the arterial wall. Sorry if that's a little too lectury for you. So here you see an active run of volume pulse waves. I have reattached the plethysmograph to my finger. And you see that the volume doesn't stay exactly the same all the time. We do have the ability and we do change the volume of blood that goes into our finger or any other body part for any number of reasons at any given moment. In fact, I'll just show you a couple things here and try to explain this a little bit to you. So what I'm going to do, you can't see me because I'm off camera right now, is I'm going to simply stand up out of my chair without allowing my hands to move around any more than they have to. And I want you to watch this volume pulse waveform and pay particular attention to its height, its amplitude. You'll definitely be able to see when I stand up because there'll be a whole big gob of electrical noise on my trace. So here we go. I'm standing now. And keep watching this waveform. and then I'll stop it and let's discuss a little bit if we can. So I will use my controls and scroll backward. I can see the point where I stood. I'm going to go all the way back to the start of this particular trace. Boy, I let that run a while, didn't I? Unless I already zipped past. Okay, there it is. So it starts a little more than two squares up, falling a little bit, rising a little bit, hovering right about two squares, increasing a little bit, increasing. Now it's almost two and a half. And then notice it starts to fall back up, down. This is normal, totally normal. Now let's look for that point where I stood up right here. This is where I stood. And you can see that the volume pulse wave goes way up, three squares tall, and then immediately starts to fall immediately starts to fall again. This would be totally normal right here. What happens to a person's volume pulse wave after they stand? I have a very short-lived increase in amplitude and then it immediately starts to fall back off again. What's the explanation for this? Well, of course, you have to remember that the volume pulse wave is related to the volume of blood going into pointer here. When I stand up, I had a sudden increase in blood volume. My heart's pumping a little harder. I just stood up, but immediately it starts to fall off a little bit. Why? Question mark. Well, when I stand, do I use my finger for standing? I know that sounds like a silly question. The answer is, no, I don't. Do I need a lot of blood, a lot of glucose, a lot of oxygen in my finger once I have stood up? No, I don't. So I can reduce the volume of blood going into this finger because I'm not using this finger. 
I just need a standard or back toward a normal amount of blood in this finger to supply the needs of all the tissues here. Where might I need more blood when I stand up? In my legs. My core muscles, my torso muscles, my quadriceps, my hamstrings, my standing muscles, all of those things that keep me in a fixed and standing position, those tissues need more blood, don't they? We actually have the ability to this minutely and this quickly regulate blood volume to different tissues. Thank you, pre-capillary sphincters, and I want you to remember that when you're in your lecture. We also have an experiment requiring a beaker of cold water right here and a beaker of hot water right here into which I dunk my fingers. I won't make you watch me dunk my finger in the cold water, but I will pause the video, leave it right here, submerge my finger in cold water, and then do another volume pulse. So I've just submerged my finger in the cold water for a minute, and I'm gonna start another volume pulse trace. Yes, look at this, you can compare the pre and post soak volumes. So what happened to the amplitude of my volume pulse wave after placing my water or my finger in cold water. It greatly decreased, didn't it? Usually the results aren't quite this good. Maybe it's just because I'm here and there's nobody in the room with me, nobody asking me questions, things like that, but this is quite a good result. Pre-cold soak, post-cold soak. Now let's try warm water for a minute. So now we have post-soak volume pulse right here. And you can see definitely that the volume pulse wave has increased in size somewhat. Not a ton, but the finger hasn't completely warmed up yet again. It's on the way to warmer or as warm as it was before. Maybe I should have soaked for a little longer, but you'll notice as this thing runs, it is getting larger. There you can see it's continuing to warm a little bit, my finger. So what accounts for this? And notice these nice dichrotic notches you can see in a few of these waveforms. Well, certainly there are some variations in tightness of the plethysmograph, the exact position that I place it on my finger, and of course, wouldn't it have been better to stick my finger into the beaker of water with the plethysmograph on my finger? But of course, we can understand the inherent dangers of placing an electrical appliance into a beaker full of tap water. But what you can see is obviously these changes in volume pulse amplitude. Pre-soak in the cold water, after I soaked it in cold water for one minute. What accounts for this difference in volume, which is very easy to see here? Well, of course, when the finger is cold, the vessels in it experience vasoconstriction, which means a lower volume of blood, into that digit. As it warms up, a little bit of vasodilation, a higher volume of blood 
into that digit. And you can see the amplitude increasing here after the warm soak, even more so given a little more time. The last thing to address here with the volume pulse is what about the effects of exercise on a volume pulse waveform? Well, given that the plethysmograph is attached to my fingertip, a key question would be, is my fingertip being exercised? So let's do a little run here, volume pulse run. Get some very good volume pulses going here. You see those. And then I'll stop the recording. And now I have to do some hand exercises. So maybe I'll have my hand do some push-ups. Maybe I'll snap my fingers really fast. I'll pretend to type, I'll run with my fingers. So I'll get my hand exercising a bunch here. Over here, it's a treadmill, finger treadmill. And what I'll see is changes in the volume pulse waveform. Jumping jack, hand parkour. So, I'll do a bunch of exercise with my fingers and we'll see if that translates into a change in volume pulse. Now I'll keep working my fingers as I swing around behind the camera, reposition, reapply the plethysmograph, and start the recording. So here are my post finger exercise volume pulse waves. Notice the height of the waveform. And these were the pre-exercise volume pulse waves. So you might be able to notice that the amplitude here is much smaller than it is here, post-exercise. Why? As my fingers are working, the blood demands oxygen to get rid of CO2, acquire glucose for the muscle fibers, increase, so a higher perfusion or volume of blood in the body part that is being exercised. So cold makes the amplitude decrease, heat makes the amplitude increase, I think you can see that, and what does exercise do? Exercise makes the amplitude increase as well as long as you're measuring the body part that is being exercised. If I was measuring, say, my legs as my hands do the work, I wouldn't see this great of an increase. I hope this makes sense to everybody. Now we'll talk about pulse rate and blood pressure. So join me if you would, on page six of lab number three. And let's first talk about pulse, then we'll talk a little bit about blood pressure. I don't want to go into it too much because your lecture professors will tell you most of this information. And for lab, we sort of want to pare it down to just what's important for your next quiz and or practical. So for this lab, of course, you have to know the general locations where we take a person's pulse. They're listed for you right here on page six. You can see it in bold face. Notice that these are all arteries. The blood in arteries pulses. The blood in veins does not. So if you're taking a pulse, it has to be in an artery, usually one of your larger peripheral arteries. So the radial artery, probably most common, the superficial temporal artery, the brachial artery, behind your knee, the popliteal artery, which I personally can almost never find that one. We also have 
listed here. Uh, let's see, radial, carotid, temporal, brachial, and popliteal. I guess that's all they list here. The femoral artery is also one that's not on this list. A lot of times people can't find that one because they just don't press hard enough. But these larger arteries, you go with the list that are here in your lab manual, normal places where a person's pulse can be taken. Now what is it you're feeling? With your fingers, use your fingers, not your thumb for this, but what is it I feel right now? Well, I feel blood surging into this artery causing distension of the arterial wall, much like we discussed with the volume pulse. And if the bulging is large enough, I can simply feel it with my fingers. And that bulging, that distension of the arterial wall is caused by the contraction of your heart. Now by this point in the semester, you should know what chamber of the heart sends blood down this radial artery? Is it my right or left atrium? No, of course not, because they pump blood down into the ventricles. Is it my right ventricle? No, can't be, because that one shoves blood into my lungs and back. Only if I was palpating a lung and getting a pulse there would it be from the right ventricle. This pulse that I feel in the radial artery, superficial, temporal, and so on, is caused by the contraction or the systole of my left ventricle. So this pulsation that a person feels is caused by contractions of the left ventricular myocardium. When the heart's chamber could be any chamber, but in this case we're talking about the left ventricle. When the heart's chamber contracts, that's systole. When the heart chamber relaxes, that's diastole. And yes, you pronounce the E's at the end. So if you were to turn the page with me and you see the boldface terms systolic pressure and diastolic pressure, these are the two pressure values you see in a standard human blood pressure, like this, 120 over 80. With 120, the top number, being the systolic pressure. This is typically the larger number. The lower number, the 80 in this case, the diastolic pressure created in an artery from that left ventricle. And I want you to notice in a different color, in pink here, I wrote the unit that goes with this blood pressure. You can't just say 120. 120 could be anything. Your hourly salary, your age, whatever. Until you put a unit after the number, it doesn't mean anything. So 120 millimeters of mercury. Millimeters of mercury is a unit of pressure. It's actually related, an old-fashioned sort of unit, for how far a column of mercury actually moves in a small glass tube. So 120 millimeters of mercury over 80 millimeters of mercury, or 120 over 80 millimeters of mercury. You could say it that way. But you have to have the unit behind the number. Remember this on a quiz or a practical. A number with no unit after it doesn't really mean anything. So if you had two choices, say I was to ask you, what is this person's diastolic pressure? If one answer selection is 80 and another one is 80 millimeters of mercury, you have to pick 80 millimeters of mercury. You cannot pick 80 with no unit at the end. It's meaningless. So remember that. The pressure unit for us is millimeters of mercury. Now, 
Why the two different numbers? Well, during a cardiac cycle, that left ventricle contracts and relaxes, contracts and relaxes. This device, a blood pressure cuff or a sphygmomanometer, is a device that measures the blood pressure. This one is for the arm, so it's going to measure the pressure created in my brachial artery caused by the contraction and relaxation of my left ventricle. Sorry, left, my other left, left ventricle. So that blood is surging through this artery like so. And what this device does is it constricts enough to stop the blood from moving. So if you imagine that blood gets stopped up here at the top of the cuff where my finger is, if I tighten this enough like a tourniquet, then the blood can't go beyond this point. This one's automated. I'll show you how it works in just a minute. So the automatic blood pressure cuff will gradually decrease the pressure, bleed it out, like that. You've seen this done before. And when the constriction on my brachial artery is low enough, the first little squirt of blood will fly under this cuff. It'll be allowed to continue down the tube, the hose, that is my brachial artery. When the pressure is just enough to let the blood go through, that's equal to the greatest pressure in this artery, the systolic pressure. Psh, blood goes through, that's the systolic pressure. As it continues to decrease, there comes a point where the decrease in constriction no longer makes any difference for slowing the blood down. That's the diastolic pressure. So the blood pressure cuff, the sphygmomanometer, constricts the vessel so no blood can go through, then gradually releases the pressure until the first push of blood, the systolic pressure, and then when it no longer is able to constrict it at all, that's the diastolic pressure. So I get two numbers for a blood pressure. Systolic pressure over diastolic pressure. And the difference between these two numbers, in this case, 40 millimeters of mercury, is what's called the pulse pressure. That's the pulse pressure, subtracting the diastolic pressure from the systolic pressure. So let's watch this sphygmomanometer work once here, and you can see just a standard resting blood pressure. And I'll tell you right now, these automated ones are sometimes finicky, sometimes it'll work, sometimes it won't. So now it's increasing pressure in the cuff, and I get an error message. So we'll give it a few tries here. Another error message. Third try, and of course I can edit all this out so you wouldn't see any of it if I want to. But it might be important to understand how real life works the real collection of data. Another error message. All right, so I have to go to my happy place, put the cuff on a little better, and stay calm here in the lab. Working just fine now. So we're going up 120 millimeters of mercury, 150, 160, 200, and now it's gradually reducing.
until such time as it stops. And now we have a blood pressure. So here's a resting blood pressure. 133 over 70. 133 is the systolic pressure. 70 is the diastolic pressure. The pulse pressure would be the difference between these two numbers. And you see my heart rate, my pulse rate down here, 62 beats per minute. A regular resting heart rate. Now the blood pressure cuff's kind of finicky, you have to do it several times, but a resting blood pressure. Systolic, diastolic, and heart rate.